So since we have 40 minutes, I'm not going to uh, open up with any preliminary remarks. I'm just going to say that we've heard a few words used quite often in the last two days, uh, one around um, free markets and the new economic models and some of those contradictions and disruptions therein, uh, one around terror, new forms of terror, state response to terror, state support of terror, and how do we manage many of these uh, new emerging trends. Um, we also heard a lot about certain, certain uh, theaters, new theaters, uh, new geographical areas such as the Indo-Pacific multiple times over the last two days. And of course, uh, Europe was a central feature of much of the dialogue and debate. And I think the three gentlemen uh, are aptly placed to respond to many of these uh, conversations. So let me start with the Foreign Secretary, sir. Disruptions on the theme. What does that imply for you? What is the implication of disruptions? What do they mean to you? And sitting in India, how do you formulate something that covers something so dramatic? Well, <clears throat> I think uh, for me, uh, probably, uh, it was very good to listen to the last uh, two and a half days of discussion. Because uh, if I were to identify the big uh, disruptions and the transition, uh, in a sense, I'd be summing up the issues which were debated here uh, the last two days. So I would sum it up as four disruptions and one transition. And if you're wondering that, like Ram Madhav, I've also become influenced by uh, the <laughs> Chinese uh, way. I, I, my inspiration was four weddings and a funeral. <laughs> uh, now, the, the four disruptions, the big disruptions I see, one, of course, is the rise of China. Uh, the second uh, are the choices, posture, and behavior of the United States. The third, I would say, is the challenge of terrorism, particularly terrorism from governed spaces. Uh, and the fourth would be the rise or the, uh, the implications of non-market economics. These, for me, would be the four disruptions. The transition, which also was debated, in a sense was uh, how the rules-based order is not limited to the Western developed world anymore, how, how it's become very much more universal. Uh, and uh, since actually the title of this session is Solutions, uh, the solution I would, or I, I don't have a solution, I have a part of a solution. Uh, that part is called India. So let me actually delve a little into that. India, part of the solution, let's complete that solution. What are the other parts of that solution? Uh, India and some of the countries in the region, India and the United States, India and the EU, India and China. How do we complete that solution? Well, uh, I, I think, uh, in a sense, if you look at India's responses to these disruptions and the role that India can play in the transition, uh, you will get the answer. Uh, let me let me just uh, expound on that. Uh, let's take the rise of China. Now, uh, you know, uh, it's not the first time in the last century that a power has risen, the U.S. rose. But clearly, what we are seeing is not just the rise of a global power. We are seeing the rise of a very different power. Uh, and uh, uh, also a power, whether that power would be a model to other other countries or not, I think is an open question. Uh, uh, you have now a uh, Chinese, uh, uh, certainly a thought uh, of a shared future of all mankind, uh, which seems to imply that they think uh, that the, their organization principles are replicable elsewhere. Uh, and uh, I, I would say the rise of China has been disruptive in many ways, also positively. I, I think we need to have a balanced view of it. Certainly for India, in some ways, China has been uh, motivator, an example. Uh, I mean, people think if China can do that, why can't we do that? Uh, I would uh, also say, uh, to some extent, China has opened up the international order, uh, which has allowed uh, India to, to also make its presence felt. So, so it's, it's got uh, uh, many facets to it. Uh, in the case of the United States, uh, you know, when I say the, uh, the choices and posture and behavior, my uh, observation is not uh, limited to the Trump administration. I, I think the U.S. as a disruptor has been disrupting uh, for, for some time. Uh, 
I mean, uh, Iraq was a disruption. Mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, Pakistan uh, has, was, is, will be a disruption. The American choices on Pakistan. Uh, uh, I think the Obama administration's choices on Russia uh, were a disruption to the conduct of international politics. Uh, I'm not debating the merits of it. I'm just pointing out that these were disruptions. And the accumulated disruptions, in a sense, are today the situation which uh, America confronts. Uh, and uh, you are, we, are, we discussed how, we have discussed in other sessions how politics has become more bilateral uh, and more outcome oriented. Uh, and uh, on the, uh, similarly, on the non market economics, uh, uh, we have discussed connectivity and opaque investments, et cetera. Possibly what we have not discussed. Uh, are today constrictions being put on trade in services, mm -hmm. the walls which are coming up. The, uh, so it isn't uh, just the uh, market, non-market societies which are practicing non-market economics. I think a lot of market economies are also practicing non-market uh, policies. Uh, Secretary General, sitting in Europe, um, he mentioned uh, uh, America, he mentioned um, non-market economics, he mentioned virtual walls. I think none of this affects Europe, right? So uh, from, from your perspective, what would the real transitions be uh, sitting in France, seeing, being perhaps the beacon of a continent which is perceived in Asia to be in retreat or to have, have its own doubts about itself? How do you see uh, disruptions and solutions going ahead? So that's a very vast, uh, vast question you are raising. Actually, we are living in the time of uncertainties. Last year was France uncertain. What would the French vote after the Brexit, which was not predicted, after uh, President Trump's election, which was not predicted? Observers would have said France will go and follow populist voices. And actually, there was a bet made by President Macron there were parties, traditional parties, separated, divided into two parts. The ones who were for opening up are the ones to close down, erect barriers. And President Macron said, I want to open up. We are in a global world. We must face the global world. That's the way we shall set up a new dynamics. And with these dynamics, we can try to make the lines move. That's what happened. And the French voted for opening up, which means more exchange, more mobility, and actually to face the disruptive world, the global world, which is disrupted, and President Macron has since then uh, set up uh, four priorities which are at stake and which are the disruptions of the world. Security. Security means terrorism, was mentioned by a Foreign Secretary. Uh, terrorism, and there is also all the tensions we know in our regions and rising tensions. And no one knows exactly what will happen. President Macron said, we want a method. Facing these uh, security issues, we need dialogue, which doesn't mean, doesn't mean complacency. We need firmness, which implies that we can, they can be also use of force against terrorism by all means, at all price. Then there is another uh, challenge he, he defined, which was independence. In the global world, in this disrupted global world, we must remain independent, something we share very much with our Indian partners. Independence doesn't mean splendid isolation. It means the right being free to choose one's own partners. What we try to do for the French, it means Europe. President Macron says we are more free, more sovereign, being with our partners within Europe. Let's have a refoundation of Europe, build something strong. Then there is the third one, which is influence. Everyone is developing, uh, I would say, a soft power. Soft power is raging on everywhere. Soft power doesn't mean militarization. Soft power is something dangerous, but soft power should be used to educate, should be used to let emerge free societies. We must work on that. Repression of ideas is the wrong way. Fake news exists. They have existed all the time. And General Petrus knows in the wars what fake news mean. It's not a new thing. I have books, volumes by me for the First World War. They were already fake news. So we must educate the people. And the fourth one is solidarity. In this disrupted world, we need solidarity. Solidarity is not only the name of a Polish Union. It's the name, it means shoulder to shoulder. In a disrupted world, uh, one cannot set oneself apart 
one needs to be together with others. And this is multilateralism. Multilateralism is the answer. Multilateralism has been hit. We are ready to new cooperation. President Macron was in China recently, but he said to some proposals of our Chinese partners, yes, but not one-way traffic. We need transparency, we need some rules of behaving. So this is how we can conceive the world of today, these four challenges in a disrupted world, which will last for long, but we need a few rules together in a multilateral world. You know, that actually raises the point which uh, Foreign Secretary mentioned as well. There are, there are two forces which are pushing towards Europe from Asia. One is the non-market economic force. Uh, and of course, it's also flowing across the Atlantic. I'm not saying it's solely coming from Asia. Uh, and the second, which is a gradual scripting of an order which is non-universal. That's the term you used, a non-universal global order, uh, which, again, is coming through a big force of economics and, and, and politics, but it is moving towards Europe. So when you're opening up, are you actually opening up to the possibility of embracing this non-universal order and the non-market economics? We must stick to the rules we have been uh, very patiently building up since the uh, Second World War uh, after eight, uh, 1989. This is a patient order. The history is not finished. So it is a, a steady building of this order while discussing, setting up partnerships, trying to find out how to, to solve, so, to find out solution. Let's take climate change. Climate change is typically the, 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 the type of issue on which we must stick to the, the, the order, to jurisprudence, jurisprudence to, to law and to public international law. So ways and means of behaving together in the global world. General Patriots, uh, both of them use the word terrorism. So I'm going to first ask you to respond wearing one of your hats, which is as someone who's responded and managed and in many ways navigated the challenges around terror. What have we learned in the last 16 years? First of all, let me just say it is great to be back in India. It's been wonderful to chart the progress of this extraordinary country in recent years in particular. Uh, it is great to be on this panel with the Secretary General and frankly especially with the Foreign Secretary, someone well known and respected uh, in America, also in China and also certainly in India. He is soon to conclude uh, at least this part of his career of government service of many, many decades. Uh, and I just want to start by saluting him, uh, telling him what a privilege it is to be here with him. You know, I, I, I think it is true to say that we respect not just what you have done, Foreign Secretary, but the way in which you have done it. And uh, it's been a privilege to have known and worked with you in various capacities uh, over the years. Um, you ask, what have we learned? Perhaps I could offer what I think we should have learned, uh, having spent the bulk of the first decade of this century personally engaged. You know, I culminated my military career with six straight commands as a general officer. Five of those were in combat, uh, and then also even had a one-star tour in Bosnia where we were doing the war criminal and counterterrorism as well. So some seven of the last 10 years actively engaged in this, and part of the time that we weren't was when we wrote the counterinsurgency field manual that we felt captured some of the intellectual foundation uh, on which we drew uh, during the surge in Iraq uh, and then in the surge in Afghanistan. I think there are basically five lessons that we should have learned uh, by this point in time. The first is uh, that in the Muslim world, uh, ungoverned spaces will be exploited by Islamist extremists. It's not a question of if, it's merely a question of when and how serious will the problem be. Uh, noting that the most serious of these, the, the geopolitical Chernobyl that is Syria, uh, a meltdown of a country caused such problems for our NATO allies uh, in Europe uh, that domestic populism was fueled by the refugee crisis, which saw a tsunami of refugees uh, going all the way into Europe, not just into the region. And also, of course, the spread of extremism, uh, the spread of violence, uh, and the, again, collapse uh, of a state. But of course, a number of instances of that. The second lesson I think we should have taken is that you actually have to do something. You cannot do what we sometimes try to do in many capitals of the world, certainly in Washington, which is to admire a problem until it goes away. 
It is not, it is not going away, and you do have to do something. Um, and you have to do that because you have to acknowledge that, as we say, Las Vegas rules. You know, Las Vegas rules are that what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. That is not true of these places that are exploited by Islamist extremists. Again, the problems tend to grow, and they do spew violence, instability, extremism, and refugees uh, very widely, causing enormous problems, not just regionally, uh, but in other areas of the world as well. The third is that in many of these cases, the U.S. is going to have to lead. There may be a situation where France very admirably has led, for example, in Mali with truly, really breathtaking activity by a relatively small force taking very high risk and achieving very impressive results. Even there, you would acknowledge that there's a fair amount of U.S. support and involvement and in most cases now, it is appearing that the array of assets that the U.S. can bring to bear, uh, which we've built up as a response to battlefield commanders like myself uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and then at Central Command, this array, this armada of unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, particularly the Predators and Reapers, which have about 150 people for each one of the orbits that we can maintain and we can do that with well over 60 of these. Now, I'm not talking about the thousands of lower flying other, I'm talking about the coin of the realm, the unblinking eye uh, that is in the sky uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year somewhere. Uh, we can do about six times what all of our possible allies and partners together can do in, on an equivalent basis. Beyond that, the precision strike capabilities, which we broadly share, but again, have a very substantial number of, and then the industrial strength ability to diffuse intelligence, which has been built up in these years of wars. Uh, these are very, very important uh, and need to be provided in many cases uh, as the nucleus of a coalition. Now, you want to have a coalition. I am a huge believer in them, despite all the challenges and effort required for coalition maintenance, and I say that having led the largest coalition on the ground, which was the one in Afghanistan when I was privileged to command the International Security Assistance Force. We want all of our traditional allies all should be together. You know, Churchill was right on this when he said the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without them. Uh, and, but we also especially want Muslim country allies. Uh, we want the Emirates, we want the other countries. They contribute uniquely to this. And if you really think about this, these extremist uh, efforts are more a clash within a civilization than a clash of civilizations to remember the book by that title by Sam Huntington at Harvard. So they have more at stake of this. This is a fight for the heart. This is an existential threat uh, to the heart of the Muslim world. The fourth lesson needs to acknowledge a paradox, and that is that you cannot counter terrorists with just counter-terrorist forces. You can't just drone strike or Delta Force raid your way out of this problem. Indeed, military force, while necessary, even that is not sufficient. All of that, which you may uh, bring to bear. Rather, you have to have a comprehensive campaign a comprehensive civil military campaign with all of the components, frankly, that we ultimately had in Iraq when I was privileged to partner with one of the, the world's greatest diplomats, uh, Ambassador Ryan Crocker, uh, and we had a true civil military campaign plan. The beauty now is that we're able to support host nations that more and more are able to provide the non-military activities and even provide the forces on the front lines. So it was Iraqi security forces that actually, with our advice, assistance, training, equipping, and enabling assets, they defeated the Islamic State that is an army on the ground. There certainly still are insurgents, terrorist cells that will need to be dealt with. But they did that in Syria, the Syrian Defense Forces, despite a claim by one of the panelists yesterday that the Russians defeated ISIS in Syria. I might gently note which countries uh, supported the forces that actually took Raqqa, the capital uh, of the Islamic State, having earlier helped other forces take the Iraqi capital uh, in Mosul. So again, it has to be a comprehensive campaign. 
And then the fifth lesson is that the effort by the supporting coalition assets and really by the host nation itself has to be sustainable. And this is because we are engaged in, an, in a struggle that is generational in nature. This is not the fight of a decade, much less the fight of a few years. It is going to last at least a generation, and therefore you have to have a sustained commitment. That means the strategy has to be sustainable. Sustainability from a soldier's point of view is measured in the expenditure of blood and treasure. And what is very significant is I think we have been gradually either explicitly or implicitly operationalizing these lessons. Uh, and you see in Afghanistan, for example, what I believe is a sustainable commitment. And oh, by the way, the president has made a sustained commitment. There are no timelines. Uh, there are no restrictions on the air power. Uh, there is some modest addition. But I mean, we only have still some 12, 13,000 Americans. I, when I was commander, we had 100,000 Americans and 50,000 uh, other forces, including a very fine French contingent. Um, so those, I think, are the five lessons that we need to have taken from this, and we need to operationalize these uh, in this struggle uh, that is very clearly one of the disruptors that the Foreign Secretary identified. The second hat, one of an investor. Are we actually investing in a non-market economic order? Because it seems that it's a very attractive proposition. Democracies are painful. Well, again, I, you know, I'm also a former, I'm a current professor and have taught economics and international relations and I don't want to get too much into the definition of how much is a market economy and how much is an authoritarian government affecting that market economy. I mean, what you're really getting at, frankly, is China. Uh, and uh, I'm privileged to be a... <laughs> I mean, look, soldiers have to be blunt. I mean, we're, we're not have this fine diplomatic uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm language. a think tanker. I don't say things like um, Look, I've been privileged for approaching five years to be a member of uh, KKR, one of the world's biggest investment firms. By the way, very significant effort here in India and growing very rapidly. Uh, $4 billion just in the last eight years in 100 different deals in the credit and capital markets alone, and then billions more in private equity. Um, we have very substantial investments uh, in China. Of the 160 or 70 billion under management around the world, uh, 15 sizable investments typically at any given time in China that employ well over 200,000 Chinese. Um, this is a hugely significant uh, aspect of our activities and it's hugely significant, I would contend, for uh, those of many, many other American firms, and even of the other, say, 150 firms in which we're invested, many of which sell goods and services to the most rapidly developing uh, economy in the world until very recently, and we hope that India will yet this year again uh, assume the mantle of the largest, uh, the fastest growing large economy. But let's acknowledge that what China did is unequaled in world history. They had two decades of double-digit GDP growth year on year for every single year of that two decades with one exception uh, around the Great Recession. Um, and again, obviously you want access to that. So certainly if there are changes in the rules uh, governing access, uh, frankly if there are changes in the rules of, that are governing the rules-based international order, uh, as the Secretary General uh, noted, this is very significant. And I would second what he said that certainly there should be accommodations uh, to legitimate aspirations, certainly there should be adjustments to the rules of this rules-based international order, which by the way, for all of its shortcomings, uh, the shortcomings, the weaknesses of the multilateral in organizations, the financial institutions and the norms and so forth, all adopted in the wake of a 50-year period of human history that had two world wars and the Great Depression, it's done reasonably well. Uh, and certainly those who make the rules will probably try to make them, but that can't be overdone. And so the multilateral aspect of changes to these rules, I think does have to be stressed. And again, while there should be accommodations for legitimate aspirations, there should be grouping together uh, to contend with those that are not so legitimate. Uh, and, and that is a concern. If sectors are shut off, 
uh, if the rules governing trade mm -hmm. again. And you are going to see. I mean, one of the animating features of President Trump's campaign, or then candidate Trump's campaign, was a sense that free trade hasn't been fair in all cases uh, for some of the United States firms engaged in it. And you'll see some uh, cases brought to the WTO uh, that under previous administrations might have been uh, held off as we hoped for uh, as China, you know, the theory was that as China got, became more and more enmeshed in the global uh, order and uh, the global economy, that it would liberalize more and more. And that actually has not been the case in all respects. It's a good, Jay Shankar, we are in a wicked situation. And some would argue that the challenges around terror, the non-market-based economic forces, and the new non-universal uh, rules-based order, or someone's rules-based order, are all, in a sense, coalescing into one paradigm in our neighborhood. In a sense, they're all interconnected. Uh, the regional political situation, terrorism, and the economic opportunities all interlink. What is the op option or the space for India? What are the partnerships for India? What are the ideas for India in the days ahead? Well, I'm, I'm not sure I'd sort of agree with that slightly scary scenario you are, you are laying out. Uh, because, I, you know, I, I think these phenomena are there. Uh, they are not all just around us. They're in diff you know, in different combinations uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, uh, if, I mean, the way I would look at it, l let me give you two or three different takes. I mean, look at the region west of India, uh, which is in considerable turmoil. Look at the region east of India, which is still very economically focused, very stable, where growth rates matter, where, you know, the economy is doing well. And uh, I, I think, uh, in one sense, you, people don't realize the, uh, the role that India is playing by, by, in a sense, being a wall there. That mm -hmm. we have absorbed all the pressures from the West so that the regions east of India have been uh, so far relatively uh, immune from, from that set of uh, viruses. Uh, the second is what we do, you know, uh, the, the world around us depends partly on us. Mm. Uh, I mean, so if you look at the neighborhood, uh, I think we have to understand uh, that, uh, uh, that when there are multiple choices to countries, countries would uh, exercise it to their advantage. And we have to sort of step up, uh, raise the level of our game. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you look uh, uh, today, I can just as a sort of top of the head figure, uh, I think we've committed somewhere between 25 to 30 billion dollars uh, in different uh, 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 credits and grants uh, in our extended neighborhood from East Africa to Southeast Asia. Uh, and a lot of that is done in the expectation that today, you know, you will build uh, the connectivity, you will build the regionalism, you will create uh, the, the kind of things which the Bangladesh foreign minister was talking about just uh, before. Uh, and the third aspect is, you know, uh, look at the big global issues because you can't, you can't say I'll play my bilateral game and the world must go my way. Hmm. I mean, if you want to, if you want to, the rules-based order depends on people who are willing to step forward and, and shape the rules hmm. and contribute hmm. to that. And I would suggest to you, actually, if you look at the big international issues, starting with uh, Paris, climate change, uh, which the French Secretary General referred to, look at the SDGs. Uh, look at the counter-terrorism debates that are going on in the world today. Look at maritime security, uh, uh, HADR operations in the Indian Ocean. Uh, I, I think uh, almost on every major issue uh, in Asia, in the Indian Ocean, beyond Asia, uh, today you have an India which is uh, stepping forward. So that's not the sort of defensive uh, mindset that you are suggesting. No, I was just eliciting these three scenarios from you. Uh, can, I, can I actually just um, offer a quick comment on what the Foreign Secretary said? Um, I, I was really taken by your response earlier that India is the answer. I, and I actually think in many respects it is the answer. It's now, part of an answer. Yeah, yeah, you would expect the Foreign Secretary of a country to think that his country's actions will be 
uh, fairly prominent on the world stage. And in this case, it's true. Uh, even just think about the notion that has been now put forward and made almost a, a rubric of the Indo-Pacific. It's no longer the Asia-Pacific in the U.S. lexicon. This is an explicit recognition of the importance of India. Uh, it's why the U.S. Pacific Command commander actually comes to this conference. And by the way, congratulations on a very successful uh, dialogue. Uh, again, it is growing recognition of the importance of this country, and I think that the country has been responding very impressively uh, in recent years as it is taking its place on the world stage in a more prominent way. Secretary General, it's quite certain uh, that EU will have to play perhaps a more expansive role, and France would have to lead that particular response. Uh, given a situation that the U.S. retreat is actual, uh, and it wants to disengage from certain spaces that General Patriots mentioned, is there appetite in the EU and in France uh, to be present in many spaces that, you, that the U.S. may vacate? Are you, for example, willing to spend more uh, political capital and resources on the Indo-Pacific, if that is an important arena going forward. Actually, you are talking of appetite. I don't know whether it's a matter of, for appetite. It's a need. We are, in fact, uh, compelled to do more. The fact is that we have the, the, the major thing we must avoid is to be alone and to be isolated. So to take initiative is a good thing. And I would like to, to come back to something which has been said by uh, General Petrus on uh, terrorism and how we have to engage a comprehensive battle against terrorism, which is not only a battle on the battlefield mm -hmm. itself, as it is in Syria, Iraq, in where we have a victory, but which, with which political solution in Syria, for instance, exactly. not yet settled. Uh, if I look at uh, the Sahel region, which was also mentioned with the Mali force, uh, which we send there against a terrorist raid against Bamako, the capital town of Mali, in 2013. The region has not yet been uh, pacified. Yes, the situation has improved, but we can't handle it alone. This must be taken over by the local countries. There is an arch of countries from Mauritania to um, Burkina Faso. There is the Sahel region with five countries. So we have, this, we have proposed that there would be all these countries together which would take over their own defense and capacities uh, to defend themselves and found a new order against terrorism. Plus, what we have called the three Ds, defense, diplomacy, development. And here, that's something also I would like to mention here. We don't have only bad news. This alliance for the Sahel region, uh, in which we are only a part of it, where the EU is involved, the US are also involved. The Saudis are involved. When President Macron went to Saudi Arabia, uh, Crown Prince said, yes, I will take my part of, the, of this fight against terrorism and this fight for a development of the region. So new jobs, prevent the smugglings of all kinds, and so set up a new ecosystem in the region to, to develop it in the, in the new world. So uh, these are good news, but what I meant, and after your question, is we cannot be alone. We need to be together with others and in that regard, I would say in a region like Indian Ocean, uh, being here in India, when we see the, this peace provider, which is India in the region, we are uh, engaging in partnerships with India in the region. We are looking very close to what we can do. We are in the region. We have the Réunion Island. We have a naval base in Djibouti. We have facilities in the United Arab Emirates. These are ways and means where we can work together. Australians are there as well, and we have now an enhanced partnership with Australia. So this is, I would say, a network of peace providers in which, in that region, India, of course, has a leading role. So these are, in fact, the steps which we are uh, starting and working and trying to do more and more and better and better. I'm now going to bring in some uh, questions from uh the audience, let me following. So. Could I actually counter something? Because I just, I, I, with great respect, um, I don't necessarily buy your contention that the U.S. is withdrawing. Certainly, <laughs> Trans-Pacific Partnership and Paris Climate, these are campaign promises, had to deliver on those. But look around. We're doing more in Afghanistan than the previous administration was, and we've reduced restrictions. There's no timelines. There's a sustained commitment and pledge uh, to that there. 
Uh, we're doing more in your next door neighbor. Uh, some of that is through tweets, but again, they're doing more. Um, we're doing more in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, and in, in, in Syria, when Bashar al-Assad used chemical weapons on his people, within 36 mm -hmm. hours, 59 cruise missiles hit the air base from which the Syrian aircraft launched the operation that dropped those chemical weapons. Um, we're even doing more in NATO, actually. Again, follow the troops follow the money, and follow the substance of the policies. Our troops are all going into Eastern uh, Europe, into Poland, and into the Balt three Baltic states. Um, uh, and by the way, it's great to see Vygaudas Yousakis here, who is the EU rep, uh, is of course from one of the Baltic states, uh, EU rep in, in uh, Afghanistan, and a great partner there. Um, our forces are uh, actually increasing the number of our heavy uh, uh, elements that are on the ground. There's an entire armor brigade. Now, again, some of this certainly is building on the previous administration's pledges, and but they are continuing. And actually, this administration, and I'm not a member of I, I, any administration or any party and don't vote in the United States, tried to be an apolitical soldier, but we're going to spend more on defense under this president with this Congress, and some of that's going to go into NATO Europe, despite disparaging comments by candidate Trump about NATO by the NATO members and, and, and a reluctance for a while to embrace the Article 5 collective self-defense component of the uh, North Atlantic Alliance. One other additional item that Secretary General's comment jarred me on, and something that, that I meant to offer earlier. One of the reasons this fight against Islamist extremists is a generational struggle is that even after we put a stake through the heart of the Islamic State that is an army that was in Iraq and Syria, and ultimately put it through the heart of Baghdadi, the leader of the Islamic State, there will still be the virtual caliphate, the ideological caliphate, exploiting social media, uh, the internet, the dark web, and so forth. And this is an even bigger challenge uh, than the physical uh, caliphate, which we can identify, track, and ultimately attack. Uh, and getting that off of the internet is a problem that all countries need to come together. Uh, there is pressure in Washington, there is pressure in the EU and various countries uh, for social media platform uh, holders and internet service providers and others to do more. But it's a very, very difficult problem because at the end of the day, you have to have machines, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning has to be doing the tasks. It has proven doable when in taking child pornography off the web. It's not so easy when it's trying to determine is this the exercise of free speech or is it incitement to violence and extremism. Uh, and this is a very, very significant challenge. There's a huge IT uh, uh, critical mass here in India uh, that I hope is engaged on this, just as are those in Silicon Valley. And Before we close the session, uh, we at ORF uh, do want to do something uh, which is which is more of, which will bring smiles to our face, which is basically thank uh, Secretary Jay Shankar for having co-created uh, the Raisina Dialogue, and I want to invite uh, Mr. Sanjay Joshi to present to him a memento on from our behalf, from all our side. you by asking you to open it. Because we hope this will adorn a special place in your room. Extremely well. <laughs> right. It says, co-founder of the Ricina Dialogues. And this will not change, while the world may change. Thank you.